injury reports, revenue sharing, all the latest topics from the SEC spring meetings, plus the impending Tony Vitello extension, Tennessee baseball trying to get back to Omaha, all that and more, all things Tennessee, a very special guest going to join us here on a Thursday Lockdown Vols. You are Locked On Balls, your daily podcast on the Tennessee Volunteers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you, Thursday morning, everybody. Welcome into Locked On Balls. It is your place for Tennessee Volunteers football coverage, recruiting, basketball, baseball, all that and more. Around 30 minutes every single weekday morning, wherever you get your podcast, you can watch us, listen to us, subscribe to us, download us, all that for free, wherever you get your podcast. And of course, on Locked On Balls YouTube channel, you can make Locked On Balls your first listen each and every day. I know you everydayers do that, so I can't thank you enough for that. Can't thank Game Time enough for being a part of the show. You can download the Game Time app, create an account, put in the promo code Locked On College for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. We got a loaded show today. My boss over at VolQuest.com, Brent Hubbs, going to join us here in the, a matter of seconds uh, to just talk about everything going on. Busy, busy time in recruiting. Busy, busy time in. Uh, SEC administration, revenue sharing, all that type of stuff. We'll get the highlights from the SEC spring meetings and more from Brent Hubbs in a matter of seconds. Uh, interesting concept being discussed right now about a Netflix series following SEC programs, what that could look like and what that could kind of simulate in terms of some other SEC or other Netflix documentaries. How cool would that be? We'll get into that in segment number two. And then the voice of the Evansville Purple Aces is going to join us in segment number three. Get us set for Tennessee and Evansville. Super regional play coming up this weekend starting tomorrow. That and more coming up as I, on a Thursday show. But without further ado, here's my conversation with my boss at VolQuest.com, Brent Hubs. Brent Hubs, there's never a slow time for sports, it feels like, because there's always something going on. You have the SEC spring meetings that wrapped up late last week. You've got... You know, NCAA versus, you know, the, the house and a number Everybody. of different cases. <laughs> you got Tennessee baseball happening right now. Let's start with the the spring meetings. I think the the biggest thing that kind of came out there, uh, at least talk-wise, was the potential of injury reports and how that could be taking place as early as this fall. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think that's something that, you know, was on, on a conversation. I, I thought Coach Stoops' remarks about it was like, yeah, okay, that's fine, whatever. Like, we got bigger fish to fry than that. But – this is a thing, um, and they're going to do one in the SEC because the league office says it's time to do one, and they need to do one. It's for gambling purposes, okay? Let's just be honest. Sports betting is a big deal around the country, and um, I, I think this is a big reason why it's going to be placed in there. Um, I think the question is, when's the timing of this? Now, the Big Ten does one, but there's their final injury report's like two hours before kickoff or something like that, which is like during warm-ups, basically. So that's not really an injury report. So the question is, is the league going to do something that you got to put out an injury report on Thursday after a Friday walkthrough? Is it going to be on game day? What, what, When are they going to do it? What's the repercussion if you don't accurately do something? And then spe- what are the specifics are they going to ask you to put out there? Okay, so like, are you going to say, can you just say everybody's probable game time decision, which is essentially what everybody's doing right now, unless – unless everybody knows the guy is in an arm sling and you know he's out and is going to miss multiple weeks or the, as the case was with Keenan Peely last year. So that's part of it. I think another question that SIDs, coaches, and everybody has is, what are you going to do in regards to a suspension, right? Because sometimes those become injuries and you never get into the fact that it was a discipline matter. How do you handle that in the injury report? If you say a guy's injured but he's not really injured – are you falsifying? You know, what What are you kind of doing there? Is a late scratch. He goes through warm-ups. And, and so th- there's some things to work through, which is why there was no finalized thing coming out of the spring meetings. Um, but there, clearly there's a move in the direction to do one of those, and I think it's needed. Yeah, you and I might have talked to the same person because the suspension little caveat in there is something that was brought up to me. It's like, well, if you put out an injury report, say Wednesday night at 8 o'clock, you might have a guy that's suspended, but you don't want anybody to know that right now. So it's like, well, how do you how do you go about that? So we'll see what that looks like on down the list um, or on down throughout the summer into the fall if that becomes a thing for the Southeastern Conference. Uh, something that's happening right now and in, 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 you know college football and, and individual schools trying to figure out how to go about it. There's more questions than answers right now is revenue sharing. And, and you've already seen it at Ole Miss. They had a $30 million renovation project for the baseball stadium 
they've canned it for right now. And, and unfortunately, you might see this happening more and more across the country where, I mean, some money's got to go to the players and they got to find that money somewhere. How do you think this will play out um, here at Tennessee? And I think the earliest this could happen would be next school year, but it might not even be here that quickly because there's a lot that's got to get worked out. Yeah, I mean, there's a ton of, I mean, who's who all's involved? right? How, how are you going to do this? Where's the Title IX factor? Are you only going to do it for revenue generating sports? Or does everybody get, you know, do, do you invest that much more into a sport that loses three or four or five million dollars a year? You know, there, there's there's lots of lots of things everybody is trying to sort out when this is all said and done. Let's start first with facilities as you unpack this. If you're a school and your facilities are on par with everybody else, or maybe just a little bit above because you've done some things the last decade, you're probably not touching any of your facilities right now, just because you want to wait and see. Now, Tennessee's in two major deals. There's That's for the fan experience. They're deep in them. They're going to finish those. They have to finish those projects. But the expansion to the Anderson Training Center, that's three or four years old and is not really going anywhere, that's not a priority to finish right now. Because that doesn't involve the fans and the players, it's not that big of a deal. The arms race for recruiting and facilities is just dampening because of NIL, potential mm-hmm. revenue sharing, everything that's going to be out there with that. So I think administrators are just trying to figure it out and trying to figure out what's happening. Because here's the other thing too: what happens if football breaks away from the NCAA? What if there's what if the super conference that we've talked about, Eric, for forever actually comes to fruition? And it's not affiliated with the NCAA. What does that do for Title IX? How does that eliminate sports that way? What does that do revenue-wise? Do you keep all the football revenue and suddenly you're not supporting other sports with that? And basketball supporting the other sports. There's just a, a whole – there's layers upon layers. And this is what Danny White talked about at the Big Orange Caravan. And this is where his frustration lies is, okay, we come up with this idea and we plug it, right? Okay, let me get my finger on the screen. Boom. We plug that hole, right? Well, guess what happens? There's four more holes that pop open because of that one you just plugged. Mm-hmm. And it's it's they, they've got to get away from just trying to patch the problems and go to some fundamental core changes to not just fix it now, but with some foresight and look ahead for what it's going to look like five, ten years from now. Had they done that two decades ago, a conversation we would be having today would be a very different conversation. Yeah, they would have attacked, you know, name, image, likeness opportunities two decades ago. They would have done this, that, transferred. Things could look way different than what they are right now. It's almost like you're playing catch up in so many different areas. We'll see what that looks like here in the foreseeable future. The biggest thing happening right now on campus for Tennessee is this baseball team, um, super regional bound this weekend, Evansville, uh, only the ninth number four seed ever to come in and, and, and compete for a spot to go to Omaha. Uh, We'll see how Tennessee fares there. Potentially, Tennessee could be back in Omaha for the third time in four years. Uh, This baseball team just continues to win, and Tony Vitello is gonna gonna, you know, they're working to get an extension out of this right now because he's he's doing great work here. Yeah, I mean, this team's tough. I mean, the 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 mental toughness of this team is is really really good, and um, I think they've taken on a personality that Tony Vitello really likes and is really comfortable with. I think he's really enjoyed coaching this team it's not that he didn't enjoy other teams but i think he's like this team he's like the way they've grown throughout the year and um yeah i mean you know this is what you like if you're at a a school that anytime another school has a job opening his name gets mentioned that's why danny white and his staff are trying to get an extension and, and get a new contract done for tony vitello but he's a guy that lots of people around the country may not like him but they would take him on their program right now because they are becoming a bit of a standard um, nationally and where you're at. I mean, they've been as consistent as any program in the country over the course of the last four or five years. He's done it from the ground up. Um, it's just a, it's remarkable what he's accomplished and, and how he's created, he's created this fandom for a sport that just hasn't been there. And it's there now. It's, I mean, this ticket is crazy for this weekend in terms of, trying to buy one online through StubHub or whatever. Um, it's pretty remarkable what they've accomplished. A lot of fun to watch. Yeah, it's fun to watch, and we'll see what they do Friday at 3 o'clock and then uh, Saturday at 11 a.m., and uh, we'll see if that Tennessee can wrap up a spot and punch a ticket to Omaha before maybe even another Super Regional begins <laughs> come Saturday night. 
Uh, we'll see what happens there. And of course, the last thing I want to mention, of course, that you know, baseball is happening right now, and it's it's engaging, it's fun. It's over there at Lindsey Nelson Stadium. Recruiting is is happening, and you know, fans don't get a front row seat to that. But you've got official visitors coming in this weekend. Josh Petty is going to headline that, and then the next two weekends in June, the last two weekends are going to be massive in terms of OVs, looking to upwards of twenty players each weekend. How critical is this month of June for Tennessee's class of 2025? Well, I think it's critical for every school around the country because June is the new January. Um, I mean, this is a situation where um, kids are not decommitting as much as they used to. Um, They're making summertime decisions to get things out of the way. I think there's less decommitments because there's more freedom to move after you go somewhere. So there's not as much pressure on to make the absolute perfect decision coming out of high school. And um, this is your shot and you, you got to have a great month. I mean, this is a critical month for everybody out there because you're trying to put your roster together, your class together, and you've had them on campus a bunch. You've evaled them and now it's time to close the deal. And Tennessee is going to get their opportunity with some really good prospects uh, this month, starting with Josh Petty, as you mentioned this weekend, they got to close and uh, it's vital for continued roster management, roster growth, development in your program. You, you can't have a bad June. You can't be you can't be a coach going to a podium saying we had a bad June because if you did, then you got bad things coming in your program. It doesn't mean you have to land everybody, but you've got to get your share for sure. Game Time app is there to make your life a whole lot easier. Last minute deals, flash deals, zone deals, all in prices, views from your seat, the lowest price guarantee. Where if you find a cheaper ticket somewhere else, other than on the Game Time app and what they're offering you for that that seat in that same section. Game time is going to credit you 110% of the value. Lowest price guarantee, game time ticket coverage, all that and more. Those are just some of the highlights that you can experience if you download the Game Time app. What is the Game Time app? Well, it's a place to buy tickets for your next event, not just sporting events, but for concerts, for uh, comedy shows, for monster truck rallies, whatever's going on at the Food City Center over there, Thompson Bowling Arena, at the Bijou Theater, the Tennessee Theater here in Knoxville, wherever you can buy tickets to your next event. By downloading the Game Time app, Game Time app, create that account, download the app, and use the promo code Locked On College, and you're going to get twenty dollars off your first purchase. All you have to do is put in that promo code Locked On College, L O C K E D O N C O L L E G E, Locked On College for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guarantee. More to come as we continue on here with a Thursday edition of Locked On Vols. All right, so one of the things that kind of became public knowledge over the course of last week at the SEC spring meetings, um, I thought that was really, really interesting. We hadn't talked about it yet on the show, but I wanted to bring it on the show because I love your take on it as well. Um, I think it was The Athletic that first reported it, but we've seen it kind of all over the place, that the SEC and Netflix are nearing a deal to give streamer full access for new documentary series. Um I kind of simulate this to like hard knocks, not specifically hard knocks, but you know, you have a documentary crew that follows around, they find certain players, they interview and, and sure they're telling the story of training camp. That wouldn't necessarily be this, but it would be behind the scenes. Look at your favorite college athletes, your favorite college football team. I think it'd be really, really interesting. And, and kind of the thought process behind what they're going for is to model it or simulate it after the drive to survive series, which Netflix does to focus on Formula One racing. It's really taken Formula Formula One, there we go, Formula One racing uh, popularity is off the charts right now, a lot of of it because of this Drive to Survive series on Netflix. Now, college football is already popular, don't get me wrong, but any chance you can look into getting into another demographic. Uh, Look at the NFL this past year, sure. It's not like the NFL orchestrated it. Some conspiracy theories out there might believe so, but Taylor Swift dating Travis Kelsey. Think the NFL tapped into another another sector of a fan base, another de- demographic? You best believe they did. And, and the NFL got even more popular last year. And so it's kind of how I view this. College football is already so, so, so popular. SEC football is so, so, so popular. But you get just the casual people that flip through Netflix every single night. I mean, I do it too before I go to bed. You see this documentary highlighting Tennessee or highlighting the Florida Gators or Alabama Crimson Tide or Auburn Tiger, whoever – you click on it, maybe you become a, a football fan. Maybe you become a college football fan, an SEC fan. So I think it's really, really interesting. They also had a, a series on Netflix called Full Swing, highlighting PGA, the PGA Tour. So the same same concept, but shifting towards football a little bit. So if this was for Tennessee, what could this look like? 
Um, you follow around Nico Iamaliava. He's obviously the biggest story, one of the biggest stories in college football, the biggest story on Tennessee's campus. You know, follow him around, watch him throughout his first year as being the true starting quarterback, having the keys of the Ferrari, how he engulfs himself into college football, and if he really is the real deal. Of course, Nico was the former number one overall prospect in the class of 2023, nationwide, according to On3, which is what we follow here on Lockdown Balls. And, um, you know, of course, the reported $8 million man, the center of Tennessee's investigation with the NCAA, all that and more. Nico would be appointment television, but also guys like Dylan Sampson, guys like um, Keenan Peely, who's kind of on this last ride, if you will. They could kind of take that storyline about Keenan Peely's got to stay healthy. Keenan Peely's got to be productive or his shot at the National Football League. Those hopes and dreams will come crashing down. More of the Tennessee football team on the Netflix here. You know, like, you know what I'm saying? Like they can take that angle for him. Um, you know, Mike Matthews, a five-star wide receiver, uh, Dante Thornton getting second chances. Um, you know, Chris Brazel, new kid on the block, Lance Hurd. I mean, there's so many different angles for specific players, but kind of the overarching angle could be like, well, is Tennessee the real deal? See what Josh Heupel did in year one, the high point in year two, coming back down to earth in year three. What's in store for Tennessee? Is Tennessee for real or is it a pretender? I mean, I think that's kind of another storyline that you could take on with this if, if we're looking at it from Tennessee angles. But um, I, I think as much as I would watch Tennessee, don't get me wrong, and I would probably write about it and, and probably do some things around it, I think the storylines at other SEC programs are even more for TV, if you will. Let's kind of work our way through. Not every single team, but let's work our way through. Lane Kiffin at Ole Miss. Obviously, we've talked about this before. Will this be sustainable? Building the nucleus of your team, not for the most part, but those high lever, those high caliber players and playmakers that you brought to your team. Will you win games, or will the locker room be destroyed and you succumb to an eight and four, nine and three season? That would be a really, really bad season for Ole Miss this year, considering everything it brings back and everything it brought in via the transfer portal. I think that is such a great avenue. I think that is such a great storyline in SEC football this year. What about Tuscaloosa, uh, Alabama? The, following Nick Saban, the year after Saban leaves. I mean, again, we've talked about I think this this roster for Alabama is still going to be really good and really competitive. And Kellen DeBoer is only, I mean, he's won everywhere he's been. You can only do what's in front of you, right? He's won games. But you are stepping into, quote-unquote, and we don't really like to say this on Lockdown Balls, but, quote-unquote, title town, right? How are you going to follow in the footsteps of the perceived GOAT uh, in your profession? I think that's going to be really, really intriguing. What about Georgia? Georgia lost, as always, tons and tons of NFL talent. Um, does bring back Carson Beck, who was phenomenal last year. You bring back all the bells and whistles and everything, and you're going to perceive, be perceived as a you know national champion, maybe excluding Ohio State, the front runner, right? How do you respond to being left out of the party last year, being left out of the college football playoffs? Um, I think that's obviously going to be interesting. What about the Florida Gators? That schedule with Billy Napier coaching for his life. That last five-game schedule is brutal. Will Billy Napier survive that schedule and survive to coach another year when everybody's saying an 8-4 and four season would be incredible for Billy Napier this year? Let's remember this is year three for him, which for Florida standards is not very good. I think that would be really, really good appointment television, if you will. Arkansas, you have Sam Pittman, who is coaching for his life and is on the hot seat during the season. You've got... Um, LSU, how do you rebound from losing a Heisman Trophy winner, but maybe bringing back one of the better teams in all the SEC? Hugh Freeze, year number two. Of course, we know about how Hugh Freeze got out of SEC coaching years ago when he was, um, you know, the, a, a former head coach, but at Ole Miss. But what's it going to be like as he continues to try to rebuild his his reputation? And obviously, the Auburn program. Um, you know, who doesn't really have a quarterback right now, but yet he is the quarterback whisperer. I mean, again, we can go on and on and on different storylines that I think are going to be really, really cool. Um, so I think this would be great. To my understanding, SEC teams have the opportunity to opt into this, meaning they would sign off to having cameras follow them. I don't, to my understanding, and speaking with some people over the weekend, it wouldn't be an everyday thing. It wouldn't even be an every week thing. It would be a, they're going to come for this week, this week, this week, this game, this game, this game, follow along and then kind of put it together, and it would it would go on Netflix, I think, like the following summer. So 
It's not like you would see anything come in January or February. But if teams opt in, they would get some revenue share. They would get paid to do this. So from an administration standpoint, if you're Danny White that thinks in nothing but dollar signs, you're probably like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, let's do this. Let's do this. Let's do this. If you're Josh Heupel, when you hate doing any type of media appearances, I would assume that he would not be happy with a with being mic'd up at practice or having a camera following him around, you know, heading into the Georgia game that week, right? And Josh Heupel and coaches probably would not like it whatsoever. But the administration, seeing dollar signs, seeing kind of what they can make revenue-wise on this, would love it. Uh, Greg Sankey was pretty pretty noncommittal at the SEC spring meetings whenever he was asked about it. Uh, but in conversations I've had with a lot of different people, this is going to happen. We'll see how many SEC teams opt in and which teams want to participate. But sign me up. Uh, I went through just a bunch of storylines, and I'm sure I left out a bunch of storylines as well. We as football fanatics, we as football fans would love it. We would watch Tennessee, of course, but we would watch any team in my opinion. Um, sign me up for that. I think that would be so, so awesome. All right, as we continue on here with the Thursday edition of Locked On Vols, the voice of the Evansville Purple Aces. Purple Aces are going to join us here, tell us all about this Evansville club and their chances against Tennessee uh, coming up this weekend at Super Regional Play. That and more coming up next as we continue on here with a Thursday edition of Locked On Vols. Here with me today is Jevin Redman. He is the voice of the Evansville Purple Aces for Learfield, Learfield IMG and, of course, some ESPN Plus broadcasts as well. Jevin, thanks so much for your time, man. Um, it's got to be a fun, exciting last couple of days for you and, of course, that program in Evansville, only the ninth number four seed ever to advance on the Supers. Yeah, first of all, thanks for having me. And it's been a blast the last couple of weeks. And really, it's been a fun group all season long. They, they've had a lot of talent offensively, which we'll dive into here shortly. But you know, it's really been a whirlwind the last several weeks going from hosting the conference tournament two weeks ago to winning that. And you go to regional and greenfield, you're there basically for a full week. Um, now a quick turnaround being home for 24 hours and back and road to go to Knoxville. So um, it's a fun problem to have being, being busy with this and looking for the next challenge. So tell me, what's the MO, uh, Evansville? You, you're, you're talking to a bunch of Tennessee fans that don't know anything about your club. We're starting to dive into the stats and, of course, the history and kind of looking at your season overall. But what makes this Evansville team what it is and, and what has allowed them to outlast the competition and make it to the Final 16? Well, there are several things. We'll first start just with their goals going into the season. It's a, a very experienced group. They've got 11 seniors or half are grad students, the other half are true seniors. And they've been so close to making the NCAA tournament the last couple of years. They won 30 plus games now for three straight years. They've been top half of the conference. And last year they were oh so close. They took Indiana State that if necessary game of the conference tournament. They lost up in Terre Haute. And there was really a sour taste in their mouth heading into this year. And that's kind of why this whole group stayed together and gave it one last ride. The season didn't start very strong. They were 10-16 and 16 at one point, 1-4 one in the conference. They had some injuries. Uh, pitching was a mess, both the starting rotation and in the bullpen. They got that figured out, and the offense has gotten hot here the last, uh, really, month, month and a half. But it's a group that plays loose. You know, they say they're playing with house money. They've already accomplished what they wanted to, which was make the NCAA tournament for the first time in 18 seasons. And uh, they win a regional in a hostile environment. And now it's going to be, you know, cranked up a notch or several notches with the atmosphere in Knoxville and certainly talent level as well. But... They've embraced it. They've had fun, and they're playing with house money, and they have nothing to lose. Yeah, no doubt. Um, and and I, there's a couple of pitchers, one spe- specific pitcher that I'll get to here in a moment, so I know that there's some talent on the on the mound. But uh, in doing my research, it looks like you know second in the nation in doubles, first and foremost. School records and, and home runs, doubles, uh, maybe runs scored, sixth in program history and wins. But it looks like this offense has been the consistent theme for the Purple Aces every single you know game out there. You've got four players hitting over 300, one right at 300 at 297, one that's knocking on the door of 400 in Mark right. Schallenberger. Um, this offense looks like it's what makes the club go. Is that right? It certainly is. And we said before the season started for this group, I told fans they'd have a chance to win 40 games if they stayed healthy and if their pitching you know was good enough. And it didn't have to be great. This had to be good because the offense would carry them some. And They've got that figured out here second half of the season. You know, I could talk really lineup one through nine. Um, there's really no you know break in the lineup as far as production, but the two batters that have been red hot, first off, Mark Schallenberger. He's a fifth-year guy that you know has been very loyal to this program, uh, hitting close to 400. He had the big three-run home run on Monday, and that sixth inning that put Evansville in front. He's third all-time in, in home runs in program history, um, but he's been steady really from day one. And Kit Futures has been solid as well. He's a three-hole hitter. 
He's been with Evansville for two seasons. He's an IU transfer, and uh, he's actually sixth all-time in home runs just in two seasons at Evansville. But, um, you know, I've never seen a guy in my time at Evansville go on the tear that he has. He's home run in six straight games, eight of nine, and a solo home run in the game on Monday tied a program record for most home runs in a single season with 21. So um, the two-three punch is certainly deadly, but, again, this offense can strike really one through nine. They play for the big inning. I mean, who doesn't? But um, if you go back to the conference tournament, a couple of stats real quick. The, the first three games, they run real their opposition. They scored 46 runs on 45 hits in just 19 innings at the plate. Uh, was certainly very impressive in that category. Scored 54 runs over four games and had a pretty solid you know production in the regional as well. So um, they also in that conference tournament real quick, they had uh, in, in, every, in each of the uh, four games they played, they had a six run or more inning in every single game. So they realized that even if hey, they're down the game, they can strike for that big inning and then they're never out of reach. Look on the mound. It's kind of led by Kenton Deverman, uh, not in one record, 381 ERA. He started 15 games, made 17 appearances. Then it would go to Donovan, uh, Donovan Schultz, who would be that game two starter for Saturday, I would imagine. Um, what about those two guys stand out? And then who would be, in your opinion, I know it's very TBD, but yeah. who are some guys who could start that game three if necessary? So we'll first start with Deverman. Um, he's the freshman. He's the guy that's really, I don't want to say save the season, but he's gotten the the pitching rotation figured out. He was the number three guy to start the year. And uh, with uh, Nick Smith, he's had some injuries and has struggled a bit this year. He got kicked out of the rotation. Deverman became the number one guy. And uh, he's passed just about every test with flying colors. The big stage doesn't really affect him. Um, you know, if things don't go well on Friday for him, it will not be because the stage is too big for him. He's very mature. He's more of a junior or senior in that category. But what you'll see from Deverman is um, he's kind of a crafty left-hander. He'll sit uh, upper 80s with his fastball. He locates very well works in a curve and a slider, um, and then he'll, he's also kind of tossed in a, a changeup uh, later in the season. Doesn't use it a whole lot, but more so of a, a three-pitch mix, and uh, he's not walked a batter in four straight starts. So uh, he locates well. He pitches the contact, realizes he has good defense behind him, and then Donovan Schultz is, is kind of a similar story. He throws a bit harder than Deverman does. Um, we'll use his changeup more than Kenton, but uh, Schultz, a guy that's been with the program since 2021, he's always been in the rotation either as a weekend guy or a midweek starter. He's been very strong and consistent the last two seasons. And for De and for uh, Donovan Schultz, nine of his last 10 starts, he's gone six innings or more. So he's been very reliable. Um, you'll see the two lefties Friday and Saturday. And then if it goes to Sunday, you know that's to be determined. Uh, Shane Harris has been the best arm outside of Deverman overall, but he's our swing guy to where he'll pitch Friday or Saturday if needed. If not, then he would pitch on Sunday. Um, if Harris does pitch, then your guess is good as mine is who would start on Sunday. But I do want to tip my cap real quick. Nick Smith, who is a local kid, he's been with the program his entire career, and he was conference pitcher of the year two seasons ago, um, was Evansville's ace last year as well, um, had an offseason procedure on his ribs and just hasn't really been himself this year. But what a job he did on Monday. He got one, one more chance, went out there, pitched four strong innings against East Carolina, gave Evansville a shot. So uh, just a feel-good moment for him and really happy to see that. And that kind of leads me to my next question. Um, you, you played, obviously, into that Game 7, if necessary, in the Greenville Regional, had to outlast the the host program. How were the arms-wise? I would imagine, you know, guys that pitch on Friday, Saturday, even Sunday, for the most part, will be, you know, well-rested and everything. But who were some of those guys that pitched on, um, outside of Smith, that pitched on Monday? And who might not be available for a Friday, might have to hold them till Saturday or Sunday? Yeah, the one, I haven't confirmed this, but just uh, my best guess with um, – Max Hansman, who threw in the game on Monday, he came in four innings scoreless out of the bullpen. That would be the one that that would maybe be a red flag. I don't know if he would go on Friday, but I think once you've reached this stage, it's kind of all hands on deck. Yeah. Um, Shane Harris did throw three times in the regional. He threw 100-plus pitches in his first two outings. And then after throwing 81 pitches on Sunday, came in and pitched the ninth inning um, on Monday against yeah. East Carolina. I mean, your season's on the line. Why not? So I would say he'd be able to bounce back. Um, so really, I would expect him to have a full um, slot of arms available. Uh, for Deverman, you know, the starter, he's basically working on a full week's rest, so no issues there. Schultz, same thing for Saturday. So the starters are okay. Um, maybe Hansman, a little bit Harris, they'd be somewhat cautious. But again, you're playing the Super Regional. I don't think uh, you can be too picky, and I would imagine everyone's available. All right, last thing. If Evansville is going to pull off this upset of all upsets against, obviously, the number one ranked Tennessee Volunteers on the road, Supers, all that, what, what needs to happen? Is it simply just let those bats go, outscore, outscore, outscore? Is that the path for Evansville to – uh, to try to pull off this upset here in Supers? I think so in a way. Um, obviously, they're going to be facing the best pitching they've seen all year mm -hmm. long, too, so it would be a big challenge for the offense. But I think for Evansville, they'll have to find a way to have a big inning at some point. Um, 
And the starting pitching is going to have to continue to throw well. They're going to have to get seven, eight innings out of Deverman on Friday, probably six or seven from Schultz on Saturday to try to minimize your bullpen usage. The bullpen has been a bit of a roller coaster this year. Um, thankfully, the last few weeks have been more stable with the arms of Jacob Myers, Shane Harris, and Max Hansman. But I think they'll have to get good starts from, from Deverman and Schultz and hopefully have a big inning at some point throughout the game. But, um, you know, as far as just embracing this opportunity, you know, Evansville can't wait to get down there. Again, they've been home for basically 24 hours. We're heading back to Knoxville after being gone for a week. And uh, it's a group that, you know, they're, they're not really scared of the big moment. And I realize that the environment in Knoxville will be uh, even more increased than what they saw in Greenville, North Carolina. But I don't really anticipate that to phase them. Um, you know, Tennessee is going to be more talented, but uh, it should be a lot of fun. And, and they're playing with house money. And, and they basically came out and said, hey, if, if we lost on Monday in that final game of the regional, we still been very happy with the season. It was a successful season. So they played loose and I went out there and West Carroll has a line. He always says, go out there and play with their hair on fire. And I anticipate they'll do that this weekend. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it, man. I, you know, Evansville obviously is, is the underdog, but yeah. I mean, you, you don't get, you don't make it this far without just a ton of talent. And so I'm excited to see these two teams get after it. Um, I think everybody in America is going to be rooting for Evansville. And I think even Tennessee fans, if it wasn't this weekend, would be all about this story. So yeah. um, best of luck to you guys and excited to uh, see some good baseball, hopefully this weekend. Yeah, I can't wait. And thanks for having me. Great, great stuff there. Giving us a scout of who Evansville truly is and uh, should be a good one. I know that on paper, it doesn't look like it's going to be a good one, but I think it'll be a good one. I think it'll be exciting. And um, But I do expect Tennessee to advance on to Omaha for the third time in four seasons. And of course, it all starts coming up tomorrow, three o'clock in the afternoon, 11 a.m., Eastern time, these times are 11 a.m. Um, Eastern time on Sunday or on Saturday morning. And then, of course, Sunday if needed. Can't wait to see Tennessee advance on or Tennessee play in Super Regional with a chance to advance on uh, to Omaha for the College World Series. All right. Big thanks to Brent Hubbs. Big thanks to all of our guests here today. And let me know what you guys think about this SEC football Netflix series and, and what's your thoughts on for Tennessee and some of these other programs around the SEC. That's something I want to see. I'm sure I'm not speaking alone here. I think a lot of you guys would like it as well. Uh, at underscore Kane or at Locked On Vols, you can always send me your thoughts, your comments, your concerns. I appreciate you guys as always, and uh, we'll tie a bow on this work week and get you set for Super Regional Play tomorrow on a Friday edition of Locked On Vols. Until then, enjoy the rest of your Thursday, everybody.